when evening had come, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe, and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. said to Job, gird your loins. I love that phrase, gird your loins. Of course, you probably know what it means, uh, or maybe you don't know where the phrase comes from, but back in the ancient Near East, men and women both wore the flowing tunics, the long gowns. They would cinch it up with a belt. It was the fashion of the day. It was cool and breezy, functional, but it wasn't good for fighting. As you can predict, the long hem of the, or the hem of the, such a long gown would get in the way if you're trying to run. Heck, it gets in my way when I try to get up from kneeling for the confession. So what they would do, would be to grab the front of the tunic and pull it between the legs towards the back, bring it around to the front and tie it off. It would make sort of a pair of shorts, which then it was much easier to run, much easier to fight in battle. So to say gird your loins means get ready for battle or get ready for hard work. Gird your loins. Of course, the NIV takes that wonderful phrase and it translates it, brace yourself as men. And that fits better, I guess, for Job's situation. You know, if you remember the story of Job, he had been arguing with God for about 35 chapters, he and his friends going back and forth about who was at fault for Job's particular uh, calamities that had happened, and now God comes to Job in a whirlwind after all of these chapters of lamenting and going back and forth, and God says, quit complaining and brace yourself like a man. Of course, a voice coming out of the whirlwind might be scary enough, just like the storm that these disciples encountered this evening as they're crossing the sea. So maybe Jesus is telling his disciples what God was telling Job, brace yourselves like men. What are some situations that you find yourself in that you have to brace yourself? Perhaps as the roller coaster gets to the top of the hill before that first big drop, you brace yourself, right? Nobody in here is a roller coaster ride, right? Or, um, how about this? You're teaching your children to drive. Bracing yourself against that dash in front of you, right? The glove box has got a handprint in it. Bracing yourself for the expected crap, right? Or how about when a friend calls you and says, you better sit down, I have news to tell. You might brace yourself. As I think about it, you know, the disciples would have had a lot of experiences where they felt they needed to brace themselves in their lives with Jesus, you know, when demons were cast out, when they found themselves on a boat in the middle of a raging storm, when Jesus turned to them and said, you feed the 5,000 plus women and children. 
situations where they would have braced themselves. Of course, this storm had to be maybe the storm of the century because many of the disciples were men of the sea, and so they would have been familiar with storms. So this one has them just plain scared. Now, one of the more interesting sentences in this gospel lesson comes at the very beginning. And it might be a throwaway line, but I think it's important. I think it's significant. And the line says, other boats were with them. What do you suppose this means? I mean, besides the fact that there were other boats with them. I don't think it matters who was in the other boats. I think it matters that they were there. That means that there were other people who were caught on a dark and stormy night. There were other people whose boats were being swamped. There were other people who were in boats tossed by the sea in the dark of night. Others who would have felt that their lives were in danger. And that, of course, it happened. It being the fact that the storm ceased and the dark and stormy night became a perfect night to be at sea. And you have to wonder what the people in the other boats thought about the storm just suddenly ceasing. Because they would not have known that it was Jesus who said, peace, be still. They probably found out later. Without knowing it, these people also benefited from the actions of Jesus just by being in proximity. Just by being in proximity to Jesus. So what's the implication for us today? Well, it's true, like the disciples in the boat with Jesus, we become preoccupied with what is happening in our own boat our own sense of survival, our own sense of struggle, fears, illnesses, troubles, changes, and storms. Why should we care about what's happening in the other boats? Well, this text helps us remember that we cannot forget about those in the other boats because even if we do, Jesus will not. Those in the other boats also experience the miracle from Jesus, just by their proximity to his boat. That means then that even if our minds or efforts are not particularly focused on others, the other boats in our lives, the other boats that surround this church, they also are impacted by their proximity to us when we act and when we live in response to the unmerited grace of Jesus Christ. My friends, with the actions that we experienced in Charleston, West, uh, Charleston, West Virginia, Charleston, South Carolina, at Emmanuel AME Church this week, and, and the vote that we have taken recently to update our facilities here at Trinity, we are in need of girding our loins. We're in need of you're getting ready for hard work. It's already happening. People are already looking at how our society can change in response to these senseless killings that go on. It seems week after week after week in the name of hate. And we are faced with the question of what will our ministries look like during and after the facilities renovations here at Trinity. Yet the people around us still receive the blessings that, that come from Jesus Christ that will emanate from this congregation, from each individual member of this congregation through the actions of just our mere presence. And how can that be, you might ask? Well, first, just the fact that we gather together each and every Thursday night for worship and each and every Sunday morning for worship means that we continue to pray for those in our midst, whether they're in earshot of our words and actions right now or those across the country, those around the world. When we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ and brothers and sisters of other faiths who are in pain, who are homeless, 
who are experiencing loss or grief or pain, they are benefiting from Jesus. And they won't necessarily realize that those prayers come from us. Second, we gather today to experience the most palpable means of grace that we offer in the Lutheran Church, and that is word and sacrament. You may hear something in the words that we read in Scripture. You may hear something in the words that are preached. You may experience the presence of Jesus in the bread and wine in a new way that actively moves you, not only to action, but to transformation. All of the means of grace that we offer through the church lead us, or is supposed to lead us, to lives of greater righteousness. This then leads us to living lives where we are more focused on how we treat the others in our lives. And they may recognize that it's because we love Jesus, or because you love Jesus, or maybe not. But they experience the love and mercy of Jesus, even though they won't necessarily hear it themselves. But they feel it in ways in how we treat them, and how we minister to them, and maybe one or two might come and ask why. The others in the boats around Jesus realized the storm suddenly ceased, and they would have wondered why. People who come in contact with you, people who come in contact with the ministries of this congregation will experience a love that may give them a temporary cessation in the storm of their lives. They may wonder why. We know why. It's because of Jesus who says to us, like he says to his disciples, do not be afraid. Whatever happens from this moment forward, as we move through this summer of change, whatever happens requires first that we gird our loins, that we prepare for hard work. Whether it's against the evil of this world, whether it's against fear, against worry, we prepare first with lives of prayer. We surround ourselves with prayer because, as we saw just five days ago, coming to church can be life-threatening. Did you realize that? Because evil now will not stop at the doors of the church. We must always gird our loins no matter where we are, no matter what is happening, no matter if the seas are glassy and calm or if the storms are raging around us. We need to constantly be praying for love and mercy and peace. We pray that Christ fills our boat with love and mercy. And peace. Did you know the Latin word for boat is novice? Did you know the word nave comes from that word novice? The nave, the definition of nave is the center aisle in the main worshiping space of the church. You are sitting in the nave. If you look up, you see what looks to be a boat turned upside down. Nobody looked up. Look out. Looks like a boat, right? Looks like a boat to me. Does it look like a boat to you? Looks like a boat to me. What happens in our boat will either have a positive or a diminishing impact on those boats around us, the lives of people who are in need of more Jesus in their lives. I pray that our boat this one that we call Trinity, and the individual boats of this congregation, the lives of those who come here to worship, will continue to be places where the Holy Spirit continues to brace us for lives of hard work. Amen?